Do about half an hour, Carol. Now, around 145,000 people are living with Parkinson's in the UK. Despite years of research, it's a disease that has no cure. Uh, one family impacted by the condition are the Tyndalls. Former England rugby star Mike Tyndall's dad has been living with Parkinson's for almost 20 years. Sally went along with Mike as he went to visit his parents in Yorkshire for the first time this year. Today, uh, 14th of June, I'm hoping, because it is my dad's birthday. So I'm going to go up north. And then it'll be at least probably six months ago since I last saw them. Um, been slightly tough for them with everything that they're going through, well, everything we are going through in terms of COVID, but then dealing with his Parkinson's, getting his medication, double jabbing, uh, not go, really going out. Um, so it's always nice to get back to see how he is, see if uh, anything's changed, whether his, his symptoms have got slightly worse or are they stable. So not looking forward to it, and it happens to be his birthday, which would be great as well. The old, the old boy, give him a hug for his birthday. Manly knocker. Hello. Hello. You all right? Yeah, fine. How are you? How are you? I'm all right. Good. Oh, it's good to see you. Yeah, where's Father? He's sitting down. Have a cake. Cute. Just what he needs for his diet. <laughs> Perfect. How are you, Father? Hello, Mike. I brought you a very, oh, very, hello. very <laughs> chocolatey chocolate cake. I know that you diet is your key. All right. Thanks. Yeah. You're wobbly today. Uh, yes, I'm wobbly. You're a bit wobbly. You would be wobbly, yeah. You're right. Yeah, not bad though. There's everything else. You jig jog. Been out for your run this morning. I've been with Holly. Been out for a walk. Really? Been around the block. She drag you along, yeah? <laughs> Things not kicking in very well today. We haven't done today, no. Yeah. But there we go. Get go another thing. jab in you. Pink yes, cushion, you? Um, yeah. I just had a little in to put one in before you came in, just yeah. as I could be a little bit more lively than otherwise. <laughs> hello, Philip, I'm Sally. Hello, hello. Sally. I haven't said hello yet. Lovely I to saw meet you on you. the telly this morning. I know. <laughs> Mike, we're at your mum and dad's house. Yeah. Thanks for inviting us in. Um, tell me about your dad and the situation he's in at the moment. Um, so he's had Parkinson's disease for. Well, I think probably 20 years, but I think he's officially known for uh, since 2003, just before we went out to the World Cup. And they burst into song once again. Um, didn't really dawn on me what Parkinson's was. You sort of, if you looked at people who were prevalent with Parkinson's at that time, um, you would say Muhammad Ali, and you looked at my dad, and you looked at Muhammad Ali, and well, it's not the same person, it's not the same, surely it's not the same disease. And then life went on. You know, I was 25, rugby was going really well, you were sort of focused on that. And when we got married in 2011, so you could see the effects were starting to sort of grow on him in, in terms of curvature of the spine, and he had to have surgery on that. And then slowly from that, sort of that point, over the last 10 years, there's been loads of other problems that have come across because of it. What lockdown has done is when you don't see someone for such a longer period of time, then you you sometimes miss what gradually appears. It's one of those things it is, I think, sometimes if you look, if I look back now, you'd, I'd take them for granted, my mum and dad. They went to every international, I think, for, uh, till, well, definitely after the World Cup. I think they probably thought once we'd, we'd won that, then we're all right now, we don't need to keep going. Um, but, you know, they wore most of the nerves for me. Um, they were always white as a ghost before the game. But... And when did you first notice that your dad wasn't himself or things may have seemed to be going wrong? I wouldn't have known it till the... I don't think I really noticed the difference until... Uh, late 2000s, probably. Um, and again, that's something I look sort of, not judge myself on, but I wish I'd done. Now, it's easy to go hindsight, let's look back and let's, what would I have done differently? Would I have, I'd have been on him more about exercising, staying stronger. But the research that was there in that time probably wasn't where it is now, where it's so easy to find things that you should be doing, how many, you know, notice all the signs of 
shuffling or whether it be freezing, quietness of voice, uh, you know, impatientness, whatever it might be, the, the, the whole, whole big long line of lists that we have now of about 50 symptoms that you could be aware of, that, that wouldn't have been there back then. Push, push! He's not. He, he would love to play more with the, with the grandkids, he'd love to be able to pick them up, throw them around. And... How many have you got? <laughs> I think there are four chairs out, aren't there? Uh, yeah, one's got one on. <laughs> so you need three. Yeah, that's enough. So you, this call this afternoon is the first time you've spoken to the Parkinson's nurse since... Since before Lockdown. he went into hospital. We got back home to yours on the Sunday. He became ill on the Monday. I managed to get him home on the Tuesday because we stayed yeah, at your yeah, house. Yeah. Um, on the Wednesday, got the doctor out here into hospital, into intensive care Thursday after after they'd done a five-hour operation. <laughs> you really are high maintenance, aren't you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the most important thing is with Parkinson's medications to take it on time. <laughs> They're not so good at which, doing... <laughs> which is also a problem that you have anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's having um, a lot more jabs. He doesn't sleep well at night. He, he doesn't really um, take part in a lot of the mm -hmm. day. If, you know, yeah. Does he yeah. sleep during the day? Uh, yeah, yeah he, sleep, he sleeps in the day yeah. and then doesn't sleep at night. And that's when then you get upset, no, well, not upset, but anxious yeah, a bit and... Well, you can, you can't, you can't move very well. You can't move, your body's like a dead weight. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you're reaching, reaching for the light, it's trying to put those on, and you're reaching for the uh, um, bottles. Yeah. You know, because you can't get out to go to the loo. Yeah. And so it's just a massive fighting, it's only fighting. Yeah. When you have got to that moment, where the doctor told you what it was. What was that moment like for both of you? I cried. <laughs> I think Linda understood more about what, what was coming in the future. I hadn't bothered to read anything about it because I was trying to ignore it, I think. So it was... You were acting differently to me, didn't you? Yeah, I cried. Mm. I did. Quite a lot. Yeah. And when you say... Phil, that you didn't maybe want to accept it. What, what, does, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't like the thought that I've got an incurable condition and as I'm going to gradually get worse and worse and worse. Because I was, was one who was always like my fitness and conditioning. I was one who wouldn't drop the ball. I would always catch the ball, you know. And this was now not happening. I was beginning to fumble things and that isn't me. I didn't think it was me. Mm. It's me to a T now. <laughs> but what have you found hardest about 18 months of not no, just... being in? Is it the fact that you haven't really had any connections with it in terms of knowing where you're going? Have you, has it I noticeably think... got worse in the 18 months? We've just been bored, haven't we? Was it hard having to have a conversation with him? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you've made 50 years very, together, but you've never spent this much time together. <laughs> It's very difficult sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah. I say, if he doesn't sleep at night, he sleeps most yeah. of the day. Um, always a, always, a, always, a, always a way of avoiding conversation, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but I've found a few people now, you know, women who are on their own who've got a dog, so we'll sit and have a, a bit of a natter and at least I'm talking yeah. to somebody. So... Uh, Instead of the wall. Hmm? Instead of the wall. Instead yeah. of the wall, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. What do you most want to keep on doing? Keep active, keep going, keep being able to do some jobs, feel I'm contributing something, not just a, a lump in the corner shaking on a, on a chair. Because I've always, you know, being an active guy, there's a ball about, I'll kick it, I'll play with it. And there's nothing, I miss the fact that I can't do it with the grandchildren as I would like to do. And so, that's what I really wish. How much do you think about the future? 
even if there was a cure tomorrow, uh, it's, I don't, it's not going to change my dad's life. So that's some of the reason why I try and do what I do now is because, you know, men are men and they they do take a long time to go see a doctor. And they do don't like talking about things and they don't want this. But what you ultimately don't want is for you would never want a young son or a young daughter to go through having to watch the the, the idol who was the sporty idol that I, want, I wanted to be. You know, go from you know where he wants to be and where he is now. He knows that that's not quite there anymore, and, and that's what ultimately what you want, what I would like to try and be involved in is the, uh, that we can stop that from happening. Well, thank you to uh, Mike and his family for taking part in that for us on breakfast. We can speak now to Lindsay Isaacs from the Cure Parkinson's charity, and that's the charity that Mike is a patron for. Uh, Lindsay's husband, Tom, set up the charity after he was diagnosed with the disease. Sadly, he died back in 2017, but Lindsay is carrying on their work. Thank you so much for being with us on the programme today. I know that you uh, know the Tyndalls, uh, the whole family, well. It, it must sort of... Uh, be a situation that many families find themselves in, a, a similar story and a familiar story for many at the moment. Good morning, Dan. Yes, thank you for having me on. It is a similar story and um, it's affecting the isolation because Parkinson's is isolating itself. That having this extra isolation has really been detrimental to so many people's health and their families. And what sort of... Uh impact is that having? What sort of stories are you hearing? You heard Mike there talk to his mum about the, the sort of extra layer of isolation that she's felt during the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. I've been chatting to some of my friends that are living with people with Parkinson's and people living with Parkinson's and um, there's, a, there's a double whammy of not being able to get their treatments like Mike Dan, Mike's mum and dad said, um, treatments being delayed, not being able to see their consultants. Then the young onset Parkinson's, which is a huge part of the community, bigger than people think. So that's people aged 40 and under who are diagnosed, who um, have really lost their confidence. They've been isolated at home. Their Parkinson's has increased and they're really afraid to go back to work in the office because when it was Monday to Friday, you, their colleagues wouldn't notice any difference, but being out of the office for over a year, they're now going to see a huge change in them and they're really scared to go back to work. Um, I'm aware that there's probably quite a few people watching this who have experience of this either themselves or in their families as well. Um, what sort of advice might you be able to offer, you know, after the year that everybody has been through? And I, I'm also aware that there might be people who have seen quite a bit of progression in Parkinson's over the course of the... the, um, the the uh, last sort of 12 to 18 months or so? So I think just try and contact. We're really lucky in this country. We've got Parkinson's nurse specialists, consultants. Try and get in to see your doctors as soon as possible. There's great resources out there. Cure Parkinson's, our charity, has a website. You can go online, see what's on there. Parkinson's UK has loads of help lines. Um, yeah, there was actually a study done recently, a survey that showed that anxiety, that is one of the, the symptoms of Parkinson's, has increased by a third during the pandemic. Mm. I know um, Mike is a patron of your charity, as you mentioned. He's got a big, de uh, big golf day, which always raises a lot of money coming up. But um, fundraising must have been really difficult as well over the course of the pandemic. So many charities have been hit by that. Exceptionally hard, Dan. Um, we have been, the team have been amazing. They've kind of gone out the, the box and thought of different ideas, but we desperately need funding. I mean, the science is out there. And one of the things that maybe will come positive out of the pandemic is the, that it's shown that the, how quickly the vaccine has been found. Um, and hopefully the same thing could be done for future drugs that we can work together um, but we need the funding um, and the golf day is one of um, our big charity days. We've also got two days later, Mike is getting on a bike for us and we have something called Raid Local, which is um, anybody can do it. Just get on your bike, go to our website, raise funds for us, please.